So it's great to be here today. And I want to talk to you about disasters and humanitarian crisis. And did you know that since 1960, approximately up to the current date, there's been six a fold increase in natural disasters? And then in 2011, the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees reported that there were 42 million forcibly displaced people around the world. And as we look at that number over the past 10 years, the number of displaced people within their own sovereign states or own countries are growing. So they're not crossing country lines, but they're in their own homes, moving quickly, likely to do conflict and war. But in this type of environment, what does information look like? And what is the new digital age doing with this type of space? And what sort of information flows and potential outcomes are we seeing in this whole new space? But I put up these pictures here to remind myself, to remind us as a group, is as we talk about methodologies, crowdsourcing, microtasking, anal analysis, accuracy, all that good stuff, really, a lot of this is about people. And what does information mean? for Dr. Hillary Kramer up in the top, right after Katrina, coordinating the American Red Cross with ground responders. What will crowdsourcing mean to someone like her in the future? And here on the lower left, the gentleman in the picture, this is Syria. What does information mean to him? Will it be crowdsourcing? Will it be something very different? Will it be him getting his family to a safe place? Will it be him using Twitter to do something that he believes he needs to do for his country? And lastly, what about the refugee camps that we have in the world? Some of them are the largest ones that I'll talk about. And what does information mean to people who are in the most vulnerable positions? Sometimes for years, sometimes for decades. What does information mean to them? But there's amazing things that have been happening over the years, and I want to show you a brief video of what happened after the earthquake and tsunami in Japan in 2011. And this comes from YouTube. Um, and it shows the flow of Twitter soon after the event. And you'll see that information comes out of Japan during the, right after the disaster. It flows across the world. And you'll see information flowing in different directions. And you'll see the global replies coming back in blue. And then you'll see the color green come across. And these are retweets. And this is really amazing about the ability for people to communicate during times of disasters. But the question still remains, is that five months later, in Dadaab, 500,000 people registered as of a couple of days ago. We are still finding that there are information gaps, despite all this amazing information movement that we're seeing in other types of modalities. In the assessment done by Internews, there were 70% of new refugees said that they lacked information. Information of where to find food, water, shelter, medicine, and also lacked information how to communicate with their families and communities in this time of um, protracted, prolonged crises. So what happens is, is that we have information that can move very quickly, can be analyzed very quickly, but at the other end of the spectrum, we have information in very vulnerable communities sometimes, where it's fragmented and there's significant information gaps. And what happens for some communities is that they are left in the dark. Despite a lot of flow of movement, um, they still are not necessarily in the know of what they need for themselves to make a better life in the setting of crises. But within these two spectrums that I'm talking about, there lies something that's growing in the middle, and that's crowdsourcing and microtasking during times of disasters and crisis. But before I move on to that, I want to briefly say that in this assessment, we found out, or Internews found out, that radio is actually a very low-tech, durable communication modality. Something to think about and remember, something to mesh with high technology in the future. And we also found out that 10% of refugees access the internet in Kenya, where telco is very strong and wide, and it only costs some people two shillings a minute to be able to use that. There are opportunities in the future for communities like these for which they can transfer information. But I want to talk to you about Mission 4636, because I believe it's a really interesting and powerful example of crowdsourcing and microtesting during disasters. And this happened after the 2010 Haiti earthquake. Groups of people came together, decided to put together a short code, 4636. 
and with that communicated to the Haitian affected communities after the earthquake and said, if you want to share information, potentially tell us your needs, tell us what's going on and we can try to share them, you can freely use this short code and all information from the community started flowing in. But what's interesting to note is that online, a whole group of people around the world started microtasking and crowdsourcing this information. But actually who these people are, 95% of them were part of the Haitian community. Haitian nationals, later on when they were able to get online again, the Haitian diaspora in the beginning processing lots and lots of messages. This is an example of one message. So online people were taking it from Haitian Creole, translating it into English, categorizing it, and geocoding it. So you'll see there's unstructured information, categorized, name, location, need, request. But over the, next, over the first six weeks and then all the way up to the, the following 16 months, there were more and more and more pieces of information. This brings up a very important question that many of us are trying to address. In this new digital age with microtasking and crowdsourcing, what do you do with information explosion? How do you filter? How do you validate? Who tells you what's validated or not? How do you prioritize? I may prioritize something different than you do, different to somebody who I may have never met before. Governments, NGOs, UN agencies, and sometimes most importantly, local communities themselves. The question becomes, should it be humans, microtasking and crowdsourcing? What's the role of computers? Should they be separate, different projects, different spaces, or should they mesh together so that we can maximize a complementary approach? But in the end, a report came out from Rob Monroe, who was a, one of a key members of how this whole project came about. And he published in 2012 talking about what happened with some of this information. And a lot of this was related to distributed networks. The Haitian community, actually, as they were translating and microtasking, they themselves became digital first responders. They called their families, they communicated messages to other communities through their own local and personal networks. And that was a very powerful way to respond during a crisis. So these are new communities, information flows, opportunities, and challenges. But I want to quickly take us local to talk about Superdorm Standing and another example. So soon after Superdorm Standing, there was a large crowdsourcing effort that was part of a relationship between FEMA, the Civil Air Patrol, planes that fly over disaster effect and take pictures, and the crowd basically brought together by a couple of key individuals from Humanitarian OpenStreetMap, John Crowley and Skylar Earl. So what happened within the first 48 hours is they launched the platform, and 6,000 people came online and took a look at this imagery and decided if it was light, medium, or heavy damage from the pictures that they saw. It wasn't a deep experiment. It was not a randomized control trial. There were no crossover studies or cohorts, but it was something for the purposes of helping FEMA make decisions. So what did we see? 137,000 assessments within the first week. 35,000 aerial images that were processed and 6,000 digital volunteers. 50% of this was processed in the first 24 to 48 hours. So a couple of us came together and says, we need to start analyzing now in real time. We're not going to wait for all the data to get pretty in the end. We're going to do this now. And as they crowdsource, we analyzed at the same time. Rob Monroe, myself, Skylar, John Crowley in the field. And we found out that it took volunteers 15 seconds to make an assessment. And over 50% of the images had almost a 100% agreement between two viewers. And I leave an anecdote on the bottom because I think this is about where I'd like to see research and activities go in the future, is what are the outcomes on decision makers? Has it made an impact? How do we know and take anecdotes that are very powerful, that we hear from responders and communities, and how do we get a better, broader understanding of what it means to have these crowdsourcing? and microtasking activities. So I'm going to skip forward over one example about humanitarian open street map, but I'll give you a personal anecdotal example. This was a crowdsourced effort after Haiti that created a real-time map. And as time went through the weeks, you could see the granularity of a map. And I was actually a deputy of operations in a field hospital. And as a first responder myself, a physician, a public health responder, and a humanitarian, I use these maps every day because it meant something to me in the actions that I did on a daily basis. We need to know how many more people like me or not like me found this useful or not. But as we go forward, there are challenges. Accessibility, knowledge, and trust. How do we know that crowdsourcing, 
with all the major hours and passions that people and volunteers have? How do we know that traditional organizations or communities themselves will trust this information so that they'll use it? What are the issues around security information and privacy? I may provide information, but it may not be secure. And will there be risks? Will there be retaliatory events? And what other both computer, technical, and human interventions or understandings should we put together to better understand what this means in the broader picture? The methods of analysis are broad, and they are so exciting. There's natural language processing, participatory methods, and so many probably more new methodologies that we, I hope, will all bring together our multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches to create something that will fit the needs of what we're looking to do. But I do want to go and talk a little bit about what happens in that last mile. What happens in the field? What happens in, within communities? And what is the impact on situational awareness, decision-making, action, and response? Because this is sometimes what the field looks like or what communities look like. You'll see on the lower left, and this is actually at one of the field hospitals I worked at in Haiti, we had a satellite, we had multiple different computers, probably a majority of every single clinical provider had a mobile phone. But what you're seeing right here is a patient tracking system. So in a very technology resource, relatively rich environment post-disaster, why are key providers still going offline? There needs to be an exploration and researchers and policymakers, we need to understand why this happens. Because this happens frequently around the world. And there's great opportunities to figure out, not necessarily to transition it solely to technology-based, but to understand where we can potentially mesh it together. And also, this may be the reality in the field with regard to if you depend on information inflows. It may be a cell phone that needs to be connected to a wood board that's connected to a generator. So how will that affect your information inflows? How will it affect your crowdsourcing and microtasking. What will be the time delays or compensations that you take from another side that will get you to the end? And so, I'll be very brief. Um, this is a diagram by um, a colleague, um, Carlos Castillo, and looks at the interface between what emergency responders need, computers can do today, and specifically looking at tweets. I want us to focus on A, on the area where all these realms can come together so we can expand that area of understanding. I'm going to move and want to propose to you all a little bit of a broader perspective. What do decision makers during disasters need? Governments, communities, tribal leaders, people like you and me if we're in the field. What is humanitarian technology? That includes Twitter, Facebook, crowdsourcing, microtasking. But I want to change that third circle. And instead of computers, I want to talk about researchers, students, and academicians. Because perhaps you're in computer science and you use computers, and that'll be part of your interface. But what if you were a journalist, an anthropologist, a design specialist, a physician? How can we all can come together and make that specific area of A larger? Because there are common goals with regard to what we want to help support during times of disaster. And I just ask you today, will you be part of this change? Thank you. I do. Is there one question from? I do. Uh, actually, I, I really like this analysis at the end of the intersection of all this, because one of the things that happens in crises and disasters of various forms is that the communication systems are often compromised. So for example, in Egypt, uh, the, the country was basically lost the internet during part of that. And so some Google engineers uh, hooked up a, a voice to tweet service. So you could call a magic phone number, kind of like the number you gave, um, a, and it would be turned into a tweet, which then restored that sort of mechanism. My question to you is, are there analogous things that you're thinking about? Or what's the best way to sort of re, reinvigorate a, a compromised communication system? Or how are you thinking about that? So one of the areas that I I think will help come to a better understanding of what this will look like and how to transfer information from tech limited to offline back to online is simulation, actually. There are a lot of disasters that are cyclical, that are frequent and common, and that's both natural and complex. And if we can begin to invest in understanding what communities do during these times and speak with them, and then be able to simulate with them, the idea around voice to Twitter 
but perhaps in another context, it's no way, voice to mobile or voice to tribal leader, and then tribal leader to some organization that can get online or can get into a technology communication pathway. But there's so much rich information that we have with communities and people who are working in the region that I think that will, and then that plus simulation, I think will really open up those doors.